you said, I think to, to Sean Carroll, uh, by the way, everyone should go check out Sean Carroll's Mindscape podcast. It's incredible. And Sean Carroll is an incredible person. I think you said there, maybe in a paper, I have a quote. You said that a soft particle is a particle that has zero energy, just like you said now. And when the energy goes to zero, because the energy is proportional to the wavelength, it's also spread over an infinitely large distance. If you like, it's spread over the whole universe. It somehow runs off to the boundary. What we learned from that is that if you add a zero energy particle to the vacuum, you get a new state. And so there are infinitely many vacua, plural for vacuum, right. which can be thought of as being different from one another by the addition of soft photons or soft gravitons. Right. Can you uh, elaborate on this wild idea? If you like, it spreads over the whole universe. When the energy goes to zero, because the energy is proportional to the wavelength, it also spreads over an infinitely large distance. If you like, it's spread over the whole universe. It's spread over the whole universe. What? Uh, can, can you explain these soft gravitons and photons? Yeah. So the soft gravitons and photons um, have been uh, known about since the '60s, but exactly what we're supposed to do with them or how we're supposed to think about them, um, I think has been well understood only recently. And in quantum mechanics, the energy of a particle is proportional to Planck's constant times its wavelength. So when the energy goes to zero, the wavelength gets to, goes to infinity. Mm -hmm. Now, if something has uh, zero energy and it's spread all over the universe, in what sense is it actually there? That's yeah. That's been the confusing thing. Uh, to make a precise statement about when something is and isn't there. Now, the simplest way of seeing, so people might have taken the point of view that if it has zero energy and is spread all over the universe, it's not there, we can ignore it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you do this, you'll get into trouble. And one of the ways that you'll get into trouble is that even though it has zero energy, it doesn't have zero angular momentum. If it's a photon, it always has angular momentum one. If it's a graviton, it's... Uh, angular momentum two. So you can't say that the state of the system with the zero energy photon should be identified with the one without the zero energy photon, that we can just ignore them, because then you will conclude that angular momentum is not conserved. And if angular momentum is not conserved, things won't be consistent. And, um, and of course, you can have a lot of these things, and typically you do get a lot of them. And when you, you can actually do a calculation that shows that every time you scatter two particles, you create an infinite number of them. Infinite number of the soft photons and gravitons? Of the zero energy ones, yeah. And so these are, and they're somehow everywhere, but they're everywhere. But they're also contain information, or they're able to store information? And they're able to store information. They're able to store an arbitrary large amount of information. So what we pointed out is, so what these things really do, one way of thinking of them is they rush off to the edges of the universe, <laughs> spreading out all over the space. It's like saying they rush off to the energy edge of the universe. Right. And that includes if the interior of the black hole is not considered part of the universe, that includes the edge of the black hole. So we need to set up our description of physics so that all the things that are conserved are still conserved in the way that we're describing them. And that will not be true if we ignore these things. We have to keep careful track of these things. And people had been sloppy about that. And we learned how to be very precise and careful about it. 
And this, and when, once you're being precise, you can actually uh, that makes you can actually answer this kind of very problematic thing that Hawking suggested that black holes destroy information. Well, what we showed is that there's an error in the argument that uh, all black holes are the same because they hadn't kept track of these uh, these very subtle things, and um, whether or not this is the key error in the argument remains to be seen, or whether this is a technical point. Yes, but it is an error. It is an error. And uh, Hawking obviously agreed with it. Hawking agreed with it, and he was sure that this was the, he was sure that this was- This was uh, a critical error. That this was the critical error, and that understanding this would, 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 uh, would, would get us the whole story, and, 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 and that could well be. What was it like working with Stephen Hawking on this particular uh, problem? Because it's kind of a whole journey, right? Well, you know, I I I, I love the guy. I, he's so passionate about physics. Uh, he just, yeah, his his oneness with the problem, and the, I mean, it's. So his mind is all occupied by the world that's... Uh, yeah. Well, and let me tell you, there's a lot of other things with his illness and with his celebrity and yeah. there are a lot of other things. A lot of distractions pulling at his, yeah. uh, at his mind, he's still there. That's he's still right, right that's there. right. I remember him turning down tea with Lady Gaga so we could spend <laughs> another hour on our paper. <laughs> <laughs> that, my friends, is dedication. Uh, what did you learn about physics? What did you learn about life uh, from uh, having worked uh, with Stephen Hawking? Well, he was one of my great teachers. Of course, he's he's older than me, and I was I was reading his um, his textbooks in in um, in graduate school, and. Um, uh, you know, I learned a lot about uh, relativity from him. I learned about passion for a problem. I, I learned about um, not caring what other people think. You know, I mean, physics is an interesting culture. Even if you make a great discovery, like Hawking did, um, people don't believe everything you say. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, people love to disagree. <laughs> it's it's a it's a a culture that uh, cherishes disagreement, and and so you know he kept ahead with what he believed in, and sometimes he was right, and sometimes he was wrong. Do you feel pressure from the community? So, for example, with string theory, it was it was very popular for a time. There's a bit of criticism, or it's less popular now. Do you feel the forces of the community? as it moves in and out of different fields? Or do you try to stay, like how difficult is it to stay uh, intellectually and uh, mathematically independent from the community? Personally, uh, I'm lucky. I'm well equipped for that. I, when I started out in graduate school, the problem of quantum gravity was not considered interesting. You still it's, did it anyway. I still did it anyway. I, I'm I'm a little bit of a contrarian, I guess, sure. and I think that has has served me well. Um, and uh, people are always sort of disagreeing with me, and they're usually right, but I'm right enough. <laughs> and like you said, the contradiction ultimately paves the path of discovery. 